Hi, I'm Greg Marcus and the pastor of Imperial Valley Christian Center. And this is our Sunday morning study the Bible with us service, church service, I don't know, Bible study service. So one of those things, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you so much for being here and, and spending some of your time to study the things of God with us, to study the word of God, to study the Bible, to grow spiritually, to grow in your faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, how we appreciate you so much for spending that time with us. Anyway, right now we're on this subject. We're looking at the phrase, what the phrase righteousness of God means in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. And he says here in verse, well, let's just go to verse 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And that's the phrase we want to focus on, the righteousness of God. What does it mean, the righteousness of God? You know, I told you guys before the story of Martin Luther when he was reading the Bible and he read the righteousness of God. And in Latin, that word would be translated justitia and it would basically mean everybody gets what they deserve. Hallelujah. Justice, like we would say justice, equivalent word, you know, righteousness. We could translate it righteousness or justice. They're in essence the same words. For in the gospel, the justitia of God is revealed. And Martin Luther got all upset because he said, well, what's the good news about that? What's the good news about everybody gets what they deserve? Hallelujah. For in the gospel, the good news, the righteousness of God is revealed. The justicia, the justice of God is revealed. Everybody gets what they deserve. <laughs> I don't want what I deserve. Hallelujah. It's not good news if I get what I deserve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we want to look at this, this phrase, the righteousness of God, and see what it means. Hallelujah. And we're going to look at the context here. Hallelujah. We're looking at the context of how Paul is using it in order to determine what it means. Hallelujah. So we're going to look at this context and say, well, Paul's talking about X. So then the righteousness of God must have something to do with X or must mean X or something like that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're started off with this, though. For in the gospel, he starts off with this, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Hallelujah. Well, in order to, maybe in order to understand the righteousness, we need to understand what the gospel is. Hallelujah. He's telling us that in the gospel, this phrase that we want to know the meaning of, the righteousness of God, it's revealed, or you could also translate that manifested, or it shows up. Hallelujah. For in the gospel, or I would say for through the proclaiming of the gospel, not in sort of the gospel story or the gospel theology or the gospel doctrine, but in the pro actual proclaiming of the gospel, the righteousness of God is manifested. Hallelujah. So the first, we're trying to figure out what it means by the context. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what the gospel is. Hallelujah. Paul tells us in the gospel, through the proclaiming of the gospel, Greg would say, the righteousness of God is revealed, is manifest, shows up. Hallelujah. So the first thing we've got to know is what the gospel is so we can understand the context. So most Christians don't know what the gospel is. I didn't know. Most of us think this story is about Jesus, the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, those things. A lot of evangelicals think that the Gospel is the story about how Christians, uh, how Jesus died for our sins, and that if we accept Jesus, we'll go to heaven when we die. Hallelujah. And, you know, that's true, but that's not the Gospel of the Bible that Paul's talking about here. Hallelujah. And a lot of evangelicals get that idea from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I've had people say to me, that's not the gospel. Here's the gospel, Greg. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Start reading at verse 1. You can see why they'd say that because it kind of says that. But once we look at it a little more closely, you'll see he's not really talking about the gospel here. But it says here, verse 1, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. Verse 2, By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Verse 3, For what I received I passed on to you of 
first importance. In the King James, it translates that first importance a little differently. It says, for I delivered unto you first of all, and it could be translated either way. It could be first importance or first of all. And I think what he's saying, I'm sure what he's saying here is first of all. It was, yeah, one of the first things I told you. For I, for what I received, I passed on to you as a first of, first of all, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Hallelujah. And to most uh, evangelicals, or a lot of evangelicals, that statement right there is the gospel. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins, or first of all, that Christ died for our sins according to that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Hallelujah, according to most say he keep Paul keeps going, but evangelicals stop there because it kind of doesn't fit the their picture of the gospel. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let me read that to you again. Verse one. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. But this gospel you are, by this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you, first of all, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the twelve. Verse 6, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Hallelujah. So what is he talking about here? He's saying this is the gospel, that's what people think. But to understand what Paul is saying, you have to kind of get the context here. So one of the things that's helpful to know, or one of the things that makes it clear what Paul's talking about here, is that in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he's responding to questions that people sent him, that they wrote him questions or complaints or, I don't understand why they can't mean that, you know, kind of stuff. And uh, and here in 1 Corinthians and 2, he's answering those questions. So watch, turn over to... 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look here what he says in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now for the matters you wrote about. So they wrote him something. And now he's going to answer those things. So here they must have written. He's not telling us exactly what they wrote, but they must have written something about uh, man and women having sexual relations because that's the first thing he deals with. It's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and so on and so forth. And there's several more questions like that he answers. So, for example, uh, let's skip down to verse, uh, chapter 8. Now about food sacrifice to idols. All I want you to see is Paul's not bringing this up. They've written to him, are we supposed to eat that food sacrifice idol? You know how they have those things, the idols, and people invite you to their party, and they have all this food that was sacrificed to idols, and when you partake of that food, you're sort of partaking of the God. Are we supposed to eat that stuff? And he deals with that question there in chapter 8. Hallelujah. Look here in verse 9. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be a, a uh, even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now in verse 3 he gets to the question. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. This is my defense. He's not telling us what the question is, but you can kind of see what the question is by what he's saying here. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Verse 5, don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us as do the other apostles, Lord's brother, Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard, does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock, does not drink the milk? Hallelujah. In other words, he's saying, you know, I'm feeding you spiritual things. Hallelujah. Is it too much to ask that you support me with your material things? 
So that was the question. So well, why are you asking us for money, Paul? Hallelujah. And now let's go up to where we were. Let's go up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And you can go through and look at some others of those. And so this is where we are in verse 1 and verse 3 and 4 and 5 and 6. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Verse 3, for what I received I passed on to you. And in the NIV it says first importance, but in the King James it says first of all, and I think that's probably correct. For what I received, I pass on to you first of all. Now, this is like the first thing he told them, that Christ died for our sins according to this. Don't you remember the first thing I told you? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve, and that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the time. You know, when we read that, you know, we start getting into this thing about he appeared to Cephas, he appeared to 12, he appeared to 500 brothers that are still living. Some of them have passed away. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, appeared to me. It kind of, we kind of missing. Well, I thought you were telling us what you, the gospel was, Paul. No, he's not telling us what the guy, he's answering the question. What was their question? Well, go up to verse, let me see, verse 12. And you can kind of see what the question was, what the issue was what they're wondering about, what they want to know. The Christian, well, what about this thing? And in verse 12, Paul says this, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Hallelujah. How can, that's the question. Some of them were saying, well, I don't know about this resurrection of the dead thing, Paul. I'm not buying that one. You sure that's a real thing? Are you sure it's a real thing, Paul? There's resurrection from the dead. I think most Christians nowadays, they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Most Christians have this kind of airy, fairy idea that when we die, we go to heaven, we sit around on clouds and get wings and we're angels and we play harps or something like that. Hallelujah. But the Bible clearly tells that in the age to come, our bodies will be raised from the dead. That body you put into the ground, hallelujah, it's going to be raised up and it's going to be made into a new kind of glorious God-powered, God-life body, hallelujah. I don't know how that's going to happen, but that's what the Bible teaches. That's what Jesus is teaching. That's what the Apostle Paul is teaching. There's a resurrection of the dead. I don't think most Christians today believe in the resurrection of the dead. So we can kind of identify with these people saying, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And what's Paul's responding? What's his argument to this? What's his response to this? How does he prove there is a resurrection of dead? Verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. So is your faith. If he didn't rise from the dead, if they killed Jesus on the cross, he stayed in the tomb, then he's just some guy that got killed on a cross. Hallelujah. But the fact that he rose from the dead, woohoo! It's what makes him the Messiah, what gives him all power in heaven and earth. Hallelujah. It's what qualifies him to be the son of God in power, to receive power from God, to reign and rule, to receive authority from God, to be seated far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named. Hallelujah. Go back to verse 12. How say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So what's his first? If you read the rest of the chapter, that's all it's about. It's about the resurrection of the dead. What is Paul talking about in chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 15? The resurrection of the dead, right? And he's answering this issue with them. Well, okay, if there really is a rebel, what kind of body would they have? Huh? Their body's going to rot in the grave. It's going to turn to dust. How their bones are going to, what kind of body are they going to have? How, well, I don't know. 
Hallelujah. But the resurrection of the dead is a thing. We know that. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah. But if it is, verse, go back to verse 12, but it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead. How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay, so now go back to verse 1. So what's he answering them? What's he talking about? What are they asking about? What are they saying? What are they doubting? What are they questioning? What do they want to know? Uh, is there really a resurrection of the dead, Paul? I, I kind of find that hard to believe. You know, the bodies turned to dust. How can there be anything to be resurrected? What about the people who drowned in the ocean and the fish came and eat them? How are they going to be raised? How about the people who burned up in the volcano and there's nothing left of them? How about how are they going to be raised from the dead? Hallelujah. Now go back and read this thing which people say evangelicals want to say is the gospel. And now read it with in, in mind the context of 1 Corinthians 15, which as you can see is the resurrection of the dead. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. You've already forgotten the first thing I told you. I preach to you which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. If you hold firmly to the word I preach. What is the word he's concerned they did not hold firmly to? What is he concerned that they didn't hold firmly to? What is he concerned they didn't? that Jesus rose from the dead and so we're all rising from the dead. Hallelujah, that there is a resurrection of the dead. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Verse three, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, I don't think he's saying first importance. He's saying, he's essentially saying, don't you remember the very first thing I told you? Not first importance like it says in the NIV, but first of all, as it says in the King James. For what I received, I passed on to you. First of all, the very first thing I told you is what Paul saying. Christ died for our sins. He was dead, according to the scriptures. Then he was buried. He was good and dead. He didn't just die. He was buried. Hallelujah. That he was raised on the third day. Hallelujah. What's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose. He rose from the dead. So there, he was good and dead. He was really dead. He wasn't faking it. He wasn't hanging out in the tomb, you know. He wasn't hiding out. He didn't really, he recovered and he walked off to some other planet, something. No, he died. For our sins, according, he was buried, hallelujah, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And now you can see why it fits this rest of the part. The people who quote this as the gospel leave out, hallelujah, oh, well, that's the gospel. Well, then the gospel is this whole thing. And that he appeared to Cephas, hallelujah. It's not the gospel, it's, that's the proof that Jesus rose from the dead. And he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters. Is that the gospel? Why are you leaving that out? It's in the same passage of scripture that you say is the gospel. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, living though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Why is that part in there? Because he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. So this is not the gospel that Paul preached. This is, yeah, this is the first part of the Jesus, I'm, rep, I'm here representing Jesus, the Messiah. I'm here representing the Messiah, the anointed one, the one promised over there in the 110th Psalm. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put all thy enemies under thy feet. Hallelujah. That Messiah, hallelujah. Christ died for our sins according to that he was buried, that he was raised on his only point there is, how can you not remember 
that there's a resurrection of the dead. When the very first thing I told you was Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. That's the very first words out of my mouth. How have you forgotten that already? Hallelujah. But that's not the gospel that Paul preached, and it's certainly not the gospel that Jesus told his disciples to preach, and it's not the gospel that Jesus preached. Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom of God. We saw that in Mark chapter 1. This is the good news. We don't understand it as good news because we don't know what kingdom of God means. We don't know what righteousness of God means. So the good news just shoots over. I don't know what that means. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Not repent from your sins, repent from your unbelief and believe the gospel, the good news. Hallelujah. What is the good news? The time has come. The day has arrived. The time is fulfilled. Hallelujah. The time for what? The kingdom of God has come near. That's what we need to figure out. That's the gospel that Jesus preached. The God, we can call it the gospel of the kingdom of God. What was the message of the gospel of kingdom of God? The gospel has come, the kingdom of God has come near. I would say the kingdom of God has arrived. Or you could say that Jesus told them the kingdom of God is here. It's come upon us. It's here. It's arrived. It's touchable. It's right here. It's touchable. It's accessible. The kingdom of God is here. Hallelujah. It's not some future kingdom. It's not some administrative kingdom. It's not some political kingdom. It is God's power reigning on the earth for his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So then I showed you Matthew 4, 17. I just first, Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom of God. Look at Matthew 4, 17. This is the gospel of Jesus. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That's the gospel Jesus proclaimed. He went around and said, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Some people say, oh, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven are different things. No, he's using heaven here because Jewish people in his day and even today, they don't like to say God. They feel that's disrespectful to God. So they'll use other things in place of God. So for example, if you ever paying attention to any Orthodox Jewish people or read, you know, Jewish uh, works, uh, they'll, they'll say Hashem. Hashem meaning God. Hello, what's Hashem mean? We think, is that God's name? Hashem? Hashem is his name. Hey, I found God. It says Hashem is what they're called. Hashem means the name. Hallelujah. The name they don't want to pronounce because it's too holy. Hallelujah. That's their idea. Hallelujah. I'm not saying that's correct. I'm just saying that's their idea. So they don't want to pronounce God's name. They don't want to pronounce the word of God, the word God. Hallelujah. Because to them, that's disrespectful. So what do they call God? They call, sometimes they refer to God as heaven, you know, heaven. When he's doing stuff, it's heaven. Hallelujah. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. In the same way that we say, you know, when I was a kid, there was a musical of Gigi and said this, thank heaven, thank heaven. We say, thank heavens. Thank the heavens, my dad used to say. <laughs> thank heaven. He means thank God. I don't know what my dad meant, but he meant thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So what did Jesus preach? What did he proclaim? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God has come near. God's reign is upon us. Let me look at a couple more. Uh, Luke 4.43. Hallelujah. I'm going to just show me a couple more because I don't have time. Luke 4.43. This is Jesus speaking and he's leaving Capernaum to go preach in other cities. And he says this, but he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is why I was there. Why were you sent, Jesus? I... I just told you I must proclaim the good news, the gospel. Which gospel, Jesus? That gospel of Paul's over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Hallelujah. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is why I was sent. Why were you sent, Jesus? To proclaim, to announce. It's a proclamation. It's not a sermon. It's a proclamation. A proclamation of good news. I've got good news, people. The kingdom of God has drawn near. 
The kingdom of God is upon us. The kingdom of God is here. God is reigning right here. Hallelujah. When people were sick and they were healed, Jesus would tell us, tell them the kingdom of God has come upon you. Hallelujah. That was God reigning in the sick person's life. Them being healed, that's the kingdom of God. When a sick person is healed, that is the kingdom of God. When a person has their prayers answered, that is the kingdom of God. When God helps you find a job, that is the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. When God, uh, you cast out a demon out of something, that is the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. 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 When you don't have the money to pay your bills and God sends you some money, that is the reign of God. Hallelujah. God tells somebody to send you money, that's the reign of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, let me see. Uh, the kingdom of God was the point of most of Jesus' parables. It was the subject of most of his famous sayings. You have to look those up for yourself. It was his most famous prayer, and yet none of us have ever heard of it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, hallelujah. Show up, praying for God's kingdom, his reign to show up in people's lives, hallelujah. Hallelujah. This was the core of Jesus' ministry, the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus taught his disciples to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God. Let's just look at one of those real quick. In Luke chapter 9, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons to cure diseases. He sent them out to proclaim. To proclaim what? The kingdom of God and to heal the sick to proclaim, to announce the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. In verse six, it says, so they set out and went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere, hallelujah. So as far as Luke was concerned, hallelujah, the proclaiming the good news and proclaiming the kingdom of God are the same thing, hallelujah. Lots of times they'll just say gospel. Lots of times they'll say the kingdom. Sometimes they'll say the gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's all the same thing. How proclaiming the good news, healing people everywhere. That's the reign of God, healing people everywhere. Hallelujah. If you need something in your life, you need God to reign in your life. If you, and God is wanting to reign in your life. And he has sent Greg to proclaim the good news to you. God's reign is here. Papa Higgin, you say, reach out and take it. Reach out and take it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I could show you some more of those, but uh, gee, look at this one. Matthew 24, 14 says this, and this gospel of the kingdom, you know, evangelicals like to quote that. And this gospel will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Which gospel, Jesus? This gospel. What do you mean this gospel? This gospel that I went around preaching? This gospel that I told my, that taught my disciples to preach? This gospel. Not your gospel. This gospel. Not that gospel you made up, but this gospel. Which gospel is that? And this gospel of the kingdom? Are you paying attention? This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Uh, people going around preaching, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom? Hallelujah. Are they proclaiming their own gospel? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the God, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and the end will come. Hallelujah. And I showed you the apostle Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God. Let me, let me show it to you this way. Watch. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter one. Look what it says here. This is a, the, he's writing to the Christians who live in Ephesus. So he'd gone to preach to them before in Acts chapter 19 and then he visited them again in Acts chapter 20. And look what he says here. Verse 13, and it says this, and you also were included in Christ. You were put into Christ. When you, you became a Christian, you were believers. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Hallelujah. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Verse 13, and you also were included in Christ. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So, Paul, when he went to Ephesus, he preached the gospel. He's reminding them of that, that when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Here he's calling it the gospel of your salvation. But when he went to Ephesus over in Acts chapter 19, look what he preached to them. 
look at verse one. While Paul was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? The answer, we never, there must have been a Baptist church. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So Paul asked him, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, you know, baptism. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one who coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Verse 8, Paul entered into the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about what? about what sinners they were, how evil they were in the sight of God, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. What was Paul proclaiming to them? He was proclaiming to them the same thing Jesus proclaimed, the same gospel Jesus proclaimed, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. He was proclaiming to them the same gospel that Jesus proclaimed, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel that Jesus taught his disciples to proclaim, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel that he told his disciples in Matthew that 24, that this gospel of the kingdom, <laughs> in case some, some evangelicals want to insert their own gospel, this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world, and then the end shall come. Hallelujah. That's the gospel that the apostle Paul preached. Paul entered the sin. God spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Go to the next chapter. This is Paul's gone on preaching. He's been doing his thing. And then in chapter 20, and in verse 25, he says this. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. What were they doing? Hallelujah. Preaching. What was Paul doing? Preaching the kingdom. What was he preaching? The kingdom. You suppose he means the gospel of the kingdom that we just saw he preached in, in the last chapter? Hallelujah. 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 That he persuaded them, the kingdom of God. He proclaimed the kingdom. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. He proclaimed the kingdom to them. That's what he's calling. He's preaching the kingdom. He proclaimed the kingdom to them. In chapter 19, it says that he went to the synagogue and he taught them about the kingdom of God. And then in the book of Ephesians, which is later, he writes them a letter and he says, remember the gospel of your, when you received the gospel of your salvation and you were included in Christ. Well, what was the gospel that Paul preached here? The same one that Jesus preached, the gospel of the kingdom of God is here. Same one he told his disciples to preach, the gospel of the kingdom of God is here. The one that Jesus said he was sent to proclaim, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. The one he said was to be proclaimed in all the world, the gospel of the kingdom. Hallelujah. 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 Showed you last week how Paul said, wrote to the Romans, said, I want to come preach the gospel to you. And then when he got to there, what did he talk to him about? Watch, turn over to Acts chapter 28. Verse 31, so in Romans chapter 1, he says, oh, I want to come preach the gospel to you. And then when he gets arrested, eventually he shows up in Rome. In verse 31, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he proclaim to them? The kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he proclaim to them? The same thing Jesus proclaimed. The same thing Jesus taught his disciples to proclaim. The same thing that he told his disciples they were to proclaim in all the world. The same thing Jesus said that was the reason he was sent was to proclaim the kingdom of God. Hallelujah, the good news. To gospelize the good news of the kingdom of God. What is the good news of the kingdom of God? God's reign is here. God's power is here. His power is here to help you. His power is here. Repent of your unbelief and receive the good news. What's the good news? God's power is here to help you, to answer your prayers, to deliver you, to rescue you in the things of this life, not just in the things of the next life. Hallelujah. Repent of your unbelief and believe. The I am telling you, God's power is here right now. Right now, say it. Say it. Say it. Say the money will come. Say I'm healed. Say I'm free. Hallelujah!
God's reign is here right now. Receive it. Repent of your unbelief. Receive it. Act on it. Say it. Say something. Hallelujah. 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 Unfortunately, I'm out of time, <laughs> but I'm not finished. So come back next week. Thank you so much for being here with us. We really, really appreciate you, those of you who keep supporting us and keep this ministry going. If you want to participate in that, you can do so at our website by clicking on the feed the ox button and you'll be able to give a donation through PayPal. If you want to look at the uh, video description here on YouTube, we also put the link at the bottom of the video description. You can click on that and also get to the feed the ox link and give a donation to PayPal. If that's what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.